Let's go. All right. Hello and welcome everyone to our learning SQL with Tino from the expert series. Today I'm joined by Martin Traverso, co-creator of Trino and language lead of Trino. So he's the true expert. I'm just here to help out. So thank you for joining me, Martin. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it's great to be here. Cool. Yeah. So last time we learned a bit about the basics of Trino in terms of catalogs and SQL. Um, just myself. Um, Martin, as I mentioned, is the Trino co-creators and CTO at Starburst. Dane and David will join us in the next episodes. And myself, I'm Manfred Mosa. I'm a Trino maintainer and advocate at Starburst. Um, we also co-authored the book together, Martin, myself, and Matt Fuller from Starburst. And that is actually available for free to download on the Starburst website if you want to get a digital copy of that. There is more SQL in there, but we're going to go and do a lot of that today. Last time we got started with Trino and SQL. Today, we're going to do next level SQL analytics. Myself and Martin cover all sorts of topics. Then uh, next time in two weeks, um, David and myself will talk about creating catalogs, creating tables, schemas, looking at the data types for things uh, when you create them, how catalogs work in terms of like different data sources and what that means when you store data on things like Iceberg and others. Lots of cool stuff. And then in the last episode, Dane, myself and Martin will talk about Functions, functions, and more functions, window functions, match recognized, pattern recognition, and SQL routine, the great new feature that just came out in Trino 431 that you might or might not have known or know about yet. It's going to be awesome. And then, of course, two weeks after that is Trino Summit, so make sure you register. Today's agenda, I'm just introducing our role here, and then me and Martin will dive in learning SQL with Trino, lots of stuff. Please do ask questions on the chat all the time. Cole and Jesse and others on the team are helping us in the background and we'll collect these questions and answer them, hopefully all afterwards, live um, after. We'll take roughly an hour and then uh, collect ourselves for some Q&A. <clears throat> for this session today, please ask questions anytime on chat, as I mentioned. Um, We'll try to answer them on the fly if it's on topic, um, but if not, then we'll try to answer more in a dedicated Q&A session afterwards. This whole class is a relatively fast-paced overview. Don't try to follow along. All the SQL statements that we're running will work on Trino and also on Starburst Galaxy where we are demoing them, um, and they will be available. Well, in fact, they are already available in a Git repository in the Trino org, so you can just like you know, kind of fire up that file and press press the run query button. Um, just focus on paying attention. There's a lot of concepts that we'll go through. Um, and then after class, you have a re re the recording again available and the slide deck and everything. So you can apply those skills and play around with the statements as well, right? Like when I put them together, things like semicolons in the wrong place make a difference. Um, and you know, when you play around with it, uh, that you'll notice. Um, it, it's different from uh, just looking at a query and have, pressing the run button versus writing them myself. Uh, quick side note, of a trap I fell into to, by cut and paste from a different system, changed a double quote into a different quote, double quote, which was like left slanted a little bit, and that invalidated my queries, but silently. And I was like, what is happening? There'll always be lessons to learn when you hack yourself. So make sure you do that after class. Um, this class today, again, is, meant, is uh, sponsored by Starburst. So thank you very much for the team there. Um, we are going to be demoing everything on Starburst Galaxy. And Starburst is one of our main uh, Trino <clears throat> champions. Um, my, both myself, Martin, and many others are employed at Starburst. And we do a lot of work for Trino there. And um, Starburst Galaxy is a managed Trino platform. And I love that because I'm lazy. I don't want to run and manage everything myself. I just want to like press the button and have the queries run. And, you can try it for free yourself as well for your experiments and obviously also for your full-time uh, usage later. Are you ready, Martin? Yeah. Let's okay. learn some SQL. So I'm going to switch over to our slide deck here, Advanced SQL with Trino. So we'll dive deeper into SQL basics with Trino. So we kind of pick up where we left off. So first things, 
first we'll look at some column processing and data types and start with a small topic. Here is a couple of cool little helper functions if that you can use in addition to the if statement, case statement, and try. Right, like as I mentioned, the try statement is a longer syntax last time <clears throat> and it can fail. So this try cast statement here, if I run this here in Star Wars Galaxy, you can see what will happen here, Martin, when I run this. It cleanly returns a null. Why is that, Martin? And why is that good? <laughs> So uh, try cast is a is basically a short shortcut for uh, doing try with a cast inside. We 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 found that to be a uh, such a common operation that um, we decided to make it a like a first class uh, instruction or or function in the in the language. So the idea is that if you're if normally if you try to cast a value uh, from one type to another and it's it, it the cast is invalid, like it's for example in this case ABC is not a valid number. So that operation would normally fail. So we try cast, uh, instead Instead, it, it silently converts it to a null uh, instead of uh, failing and failing the whole query. And this is important if you're running uh, a, a queries where you're parsing dir dirty data, you may not know where this, the data comes from and, and you don't want the whole query to fail just because you have one row that is bad. So with this, you can avoid that. Yeah, dirty data, that's a good, good term. <laughs> I think it's actually any data <laughs> because <laughs> Like really squeaky clean data is something that like takes a lot of work to make and there's whole tools to do that. So most real data that comes from some system is actually dirty. And so you have to deal with trying and casting and stuff for that. So this makes it short, very nice. Another one that's useful that also deals with now is coalesce. What will this do? This is just gonna ignore and return the first non-null value in this whole list here. This looks kind of useless in here, but this can go through much longer ones and can yeah. sort of like detect the first signal of something, right? One important thing about Coalesce is that it's a, that's a language construct. It's not a function, even, even though the syntax looks like a function. And the difference is that uh, the arguments are evaluated lazily. So uh, I, unlike uh, any function invocation where all the arguments are evaluated first and then the function is invoked, we call this the arguments are evaluated left to right on only as, as needed. So for example, if you had a, an expression at the end that could potentially fail, but uh, you have a non-null value in one of the first arguments, that expression would never be evaluated and it would never cause a query to fail. It'd also be faster then, right? Because it doesn't have to deal with all that data. Like if this is a very long list, it doesn't have to deal with any of them, right? Right. right. Cool. And then there, here's a null if. This is like a comparison. You see this one where they are the same. It says null. And when they're not the same, it just returns the first value. So that's a kind of like nice little comparison. And then if you want to check what something is, you can use the type of function. This is obviously here with hard-coded types, uh, not so interesting, but sometimes when you get some data back from a system and you don't necessarily know the type of it, then you can just slap a type of whatever the expression is around it, and then you'll uh, get some <clears throat> more knowledge here. And you see here there's varchar three. So it's literally just those three characters automatically. It doesn't make a longer varchar out of it when you do a string like that. The one, two, three defaults, 123 defaults to an integer as a number. Decimal, you see it goes and casts that point zero and actually uh, allocates a decimal for it. And then timestamp three with time zone. Well, that's a difficult, big topic that we're going to cover next. Martin, we're going to talk about temporal um, data. Why is that important? Yeah, hold on, uh, before we get into this, so uh, the type of function uh, is also a, a language construct that we, is an extension in, in Trino. It's not part of the SQL specification. And what it does is it prints the type of the, the inferred type of the expression that you're passing in. Uh, that could be a complex expression. It could be a, a reference to a column. It could be a constant. Doesn't matter what, it's whatever the Trino query analyzer decided the type is will get printed or returned by that. Function. Yeah, I showed this kind of a little bit hinting at it by having a function in here, right? Like this is a now yeah. function, which, which just returns the current timestamp 
with time zone here on the system. <laughs> yeah. Which gets us back to the importance of temporal data. Temporal data is hugely important because it's everywhere, right? Like whatever we do, log files in like any kind of event stuff, there's whole time series databases that shows you how important temporal data is. Um, and it's a very complex and big topic that everyone has to deal with. And there's a whole bunch of gotchas. So we thought we'll take the opportunity to talk about that. So what are some of the in aspects you have to deal with uh, when you talk about temporal data, Martin? Well, I think the biggest one is uh, time zones. Like you have, these days you have data. I mean, we have organizations and, and I mean, companies that deal with data all over the world. So you end up with uh, uh, time uh, events happening in different parts of the world and everyone has their own operation, different time zones. You have um, uh, even more complicated issues like uh, time zones that change. Uh, the, the, I mean, the actual time changing you have daylight, daylight savings, like in the. In I was going to say, I'm where... not a fan of daylight savings time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's uh, timestamps with uh, with time zone daylight savings is one of the most confusing topics for anyone that's uh, starting to look at uh, temporal data in, in I mean, Trino any SQL database, and is is a thing that trips up everyone uh, the first time. So. Yeah, and as as you can see, there's other aspects to consider. Just to uh, like capture a bit what's going on with temporal data as well. There's obviously date and time are two different concepts, right? Like there's a certain day, and then there's the like lower level time time zone. Martino already mentioned another imp important aspect is precision. That's something that Trino is really amazing at. Um, there was a big initiative. I want to say two years ago now. I don't even know. Some roughly like that, where we worked a lot on precision and really did a big overhaul, and it's really amazing now, right? Yeah, so Trina used to support only millisecond precision for uh, all the daytime types. And I think it was in 2019, we, we revamped the whole system to support arbitrary precision. So you can, you can represent uh, any uh, time uh, and, and daytime uh, types, or time, uh, sorry, timestamp and timestamp with time zone with up to 12 uh, decimal numbers of precision. So that's uh, basically a pico picosecond precision. So you can play signs and Wall Street trading with it. <laughs> 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 All right, and of course the underlying data sources have to support that and then the type making comes in play and there are lots of functions. So let's dive in a little bit more what there are. So first of all, there's a lot of data types involved. So as you saw before in, in the query editor, this came back with the type timestamp three with time zone. So Martin, these are the main data types you said. Can you tell us a bit more about them? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so so you have to, there's basically three classifications of, uh, of uh, for these data, daytime types. The, yeah, the, the types that represent, um, well, let's, let's look at the bottom ones, which are very, very easy. So intervals. Uh, these are types that represent the uh, durations. Like you, you want to represent like so many days and hours and minutes uh, uh, since some some point in time, or so many months and years. So uh, there's a couple of built-in types. Trino doesn't support the full range of types from the spec around that, and this is one of the areas where we're going to improve uh, things in the future. But uh, for the for the most common uses, uh, those two, two types, interval, year to month, and day to second, are are uh, sufficient. Then you have two, I, I would say, two classifications. You have types that have a time zone and types that don't have a time zone. So, for example, time zone with time zone represents a point in time. It's like if you if you were to draw a line through uh, through time. And you mark a point uh, at a given uh, moment. Uh, that's uh, represented by a time zone with time zone. In Trino, uh, that event is has a time time zone associated with it. So you can interpret uh, or or display the the, the event uh, the moment that event happened in some time zone that uh, is interesting to the user. It could be when the event where when the event got got uh, generated. Uh, in in the time zone of the place where it got generated, or you can then reinterpret it in a different time zone if um, if you want to uh, see, for example, let's say you have midnight in in the UK, 
would be uh, eight hours before in 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 California. So uh, you can do those translations if you know what the time zone is. And then you have date and timestamp that don't have a time zone associated with it. Those are uh, what what you would normally think of as a calendar um, or a wall, uh, what would people call a wall clock uh, date or, or timestamp. Um, for example, if you're if you're saying, well, today is November 1st, 2023, that's a date. It doesn't have any time, time, time zone associated with it. Uh, if you say, further says, uh, November 1st, uh, 2023 at 9 a.m. Uh, that, that doesn't have a time stamp associated with it. It's what, what, what's called a wall clock uh, time. So in a sense, those types have just a set of uh, fields. You could say it has a, they have a, a year, month, date, in the case of a time stamp, hour, minute, second, and that's it. So you can, you, you can conceptually think of them that way. Uh, so they are not meant to do precise, I mean, event time calculations. Um, there's a way to convert between, between the, the different types, but uh, that, that's kind of the, the, the difference. Cool. And then we have some uh, aliases that make this as simple as well, like alias names, just timestamp, timestamp with time zone, time, and time without time zone. Those are just aliases and they leave off the P here, for example, but um, they, they might pop up as well. Correct, and that, that's for legacy reasons because uh, back before 2019, we didn't used to have precision in, in, in the types. We had just these types and they represented millisecond precision. So when we added pre uh, arbitrary precision, we added the new definition of the types and we alias these to say timestamp with precision three or timestamp with time zone with precision three and so on. Yeah, awesome. And that's the precision. So. Um, as Martin already mentioned, there is milliseconds and picoseconds up to important uh, only available. Now, two, uh, a couple of things uh, important there. When you cast to a lower position, it actually causes rounding. It doesn't just chop things off. It does a rounding, which is very nice because it's more accurate. And then when you go to a higher position, it just pads it with zeros because it obviously it can't just invent random sort of like lower precision times. That, that wouldn't make sense. Um, the support in data sources varies a lot, right? So can you maybe tell us uh, some observations from that? Different yeah, databases, there are, different yeah, of systems. course, there, is, yeah, there are some databases. Uh, for example, if you look at Oracle, I think they support uh, microsecond precision for timestamps up to microsecond precision. Um, some other databases uh, support different ranges. So in Trino, when we, when you say you're you're uh, mounting a table from a connector that supports higher level precision, uh, that gets that can get mapped to a lower level. It gets mapped to a lower level. Uh, sorry, you have a lower level of precision. It gets mapped to the lower level of precision in 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 Trino. For example, uh, if you if you create, well, let's say a table, you have a table array exists in in Oracle, it will get uh, shown as a precision six, right? If you have a, if you try to create a table with higher precision, then uh, uh, the engine can automatically create a, a table with lower precision for you. Uh, now that that, that that can trip uh, trip up uh, people when when you see that for the first time, but uh, it, it's the, the things we have to do to adapt different systems. Uh, mm -hmm. Iceberg supports, I think, nanosecond precision. So again, when you're reading an iceberg table, uh, you're gonna be uh, run uh, basically rounding values, or when you're inserting to an uh, iceberg, you're going to be rounding values if you're dealing with higher precision than that. So, and as usual, our connectors take care of that for you, so that's really cool, right? Now, I also observed that on the client side, there's also varying support. By the way, when I was playing around with this, and like one of the clients I played with, um, the higher precision sort of detail, like sub second values, didn't actually show up, they just sort of like disappeared. So Keep that in mind when you yeah. when you play with that kind of stuff. Yeah, part of that is uh, it's something that happened during the transition to when we add support for high, higher precisions. So clients didn't understand anything but millisecond precision. So we had to add a uh, an extension to the Trino protocol to allow clients to say, "I understand higher level precisions, so present the values to me in that higher level precision if if, if the data is is uh, modeled like uh, that way." Otherwise, 
uh, the, 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 the engine will, before presenting the results to the client, will convert it back to three, uh, three decimals or millisecond precision so that it's compatible with all clients. So maybe yeah. that's something, some of, those are some of the things that you're running into. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's not that easy on the surface <laughs> or when you dive into it. So here's some example declarations, right? So you can just say, like, select date and then like use the ISO date format. And you see here also select time, select time stamp with the subsection. And that, that would um, uh, cast or, and like create that time or timestamp or date value. Cole is having an interesting yeah, question that's kind of related also to something that came up before. How can you tell? Yeah, sorry, let me let me uh, uh, make one comment here. The these are what's called like the, it's called uh, type literals. So this is this this applies to pretty much every type in in Trino. Uh, yeah. You you can have a, a the name of a type and in between quotes a value that is specific to that type and that creates a value of that given type. Yeah. So if if I run this, you'll see here, um, like here for example. If I run this, you see here it it brings me that full value. And if I would go type off that, it would change timestamp. Timestamp four. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cole asked, um, how can you tell if something is a a function or a part of the like language, as you explained before? I think that's quite difficult, actually, isn't it? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you need to go look at the spec to see if something is part of the spec. I mean, fortunately, we don't distinguish that in 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 our documentation. We could, but at the end of the day, for someone that is just using Trino, it doesn't really matter doesn't, what's in the spec. Yeah, or not. It's like they have, like, it's like they know the functionality is there, so they can use it. Yeah, that that that's the difference when me and Martin talk. Like it's a bit of an inside of baseball. Martin knows way too much about this stuff. <laughs> so let's dive a bit more into something. So here's one thing that's really cool. I think the intervals and these uh, different operator uh, like uh, declarations. There's a lot of ways to like just do normal time operations, adding and subtracting time. Right? You see here, I can go select date, some date and add 21 years and five months and that will work just fine right so if i go like that and this is very explicit right like you can very nicely say here though like this person born on the 21st in 2012 will turn 21 in five months in 2034 something in the future essentially right so um and and these are obviously very useful but you need to have an interval declared like that and that makes it a bit harder we also have a whole bunch of functions available so one of them is date add so date add you can just declare what you want to add then the amount and then what you're adding it to in this case i'm adding today to now and then this is in three weeks <clears throat> so this does an automatic kind of up like Subtract. You could also do a subtract here, right? Like you could go minus twenty-one, right, Martin? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. And by the way, the uh, date add and date diff. Uh, if I recall, these, these are functions that have existed for like since the beginning of uh, of uh, Trino. And if I recall, they are they were modeled after MySQL functions. Uh, I mean, MySQL has a bunch of, of functions for manipulating dates. So we say, okay, uh, it was back in the day when we we're trying to. Um, uh, have people migrate workloads from uh, from Hive to to Trino, and and Hive was more after MySQL, so it had all these functions, and we we were trying to make it easy for users. So, yeah, and then that's I think a general thing. Like, there's a lot of these kind of functions available. Um, you look them up in the documentation, but um, if you're familiar with, that's also why Trino is following the standard, right? Like ISO standard, and stays close to other standards. So that people that come from other database systems discover a lot of things that are familiar. Right. You see date diff here again, similar. This now calculates a difference, right? So this is, for example, an easy hack to calculate the age of someone, right? Like you just use date diff, birth date with now done. Or you can parse a duration. This, if I run this parse duration, what will come out is. <coughs> The duration in the 
full syntax. So this is here. It's a bit small, unfortunately. That's, yeah, that's, that's an interval syntax. Uh, yes. That's basically three, like three days. Days and three days, days, nineteen hours, and so on. Yeah. So that's adding, subtracting. Of course, there's convenience functions available. You saw that before already. I ran now, which returns the same as the same uh, keyword here, current timestamp. You also can do current date, which creates a date value. Current time creates a time value, like we talked about before. Local time and local timestamp then do the same with the time zone added, right? What time zone is being used here when you run this, Martin? That would be the uh, time. Well, hold on. So for local time, there's no time zone, and for local time zone, there's no time zone. Uh, so that's oh, yeah, whatever. Yeah, whatever uh, is your your watch is saying basically. <laughs> if your watch says it's nine twenty six, that's what it's, it's gonna uh, display. Well, for my the Mac other ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. For your Mac. Um, for the other ones, uh, current timestamp. That's that produces a time zone with time zone, and the time zone that it uses is the time zone in your uh, session. Uh, so, as a, when the client connects to to Trino, it has a time zone associated time time zone associated with it, and the the system computes the timestamp uh, and renders and attaches the time zone from the from the session. So. That's why you see that. And the session, just for those of you that attended last time, didn't attend last time, session is basically my interaction with Trino with my client, which is why <laughs> me being over in, uh, in BC, that's why it gets America Vancouver, because my laptop has America Vancouver as the time zone set. Right. For you, it would probably show San Same Francisco. Or that's America, Los, Los Angeles. Angeles. Pardon? Yeah, I would say America, Los Angeles, which is the, the West Coast uh, time. time yeah, zone. it's actually the same time zone, but it's just like it also takes into account <laughs> what set as a word in your operating system slash client application, basically. So those are convenience functions. There's lots more things possible, so you can cast them and parse them and convert them from various things, right? Like uh, from Unix time, for example, the very common system that is used in computers where it's like milliseconds since... 19 whatever 70 17. Or yeah Jan january 1st 1970 yeah yeah and then like obviously the iso date format uh of uh, that we saw earlier already you can parse that from strings you can convert to it and other functionality there's lots of things um you can also make this much more powerful so there's the date format function for example which is like very powerful and you can use this syntax that you may be familiar from Java and other places where you go percent D, percent M. So this one, for example, if I run that, it will return day 01 in November of the year 2023, ninth hour, right? Like, I mean, it has the zeros padded in front. That's maybe not that great, but, um, you know, you can literally like make a sentence and whatever and parse that into it. Human readable seconds is also interesting because obviously I don't know what 300 and whatever 70,000 seconds are, but 10 hours sounds much more reasonable to me. So uh, that's a quick and easy way to, to make it readable and understandable where you don't need to go about parsing and like chopping it up. If you just want it human readable, use that. That's really nice. Yeah, and obviously, way, the, uh... I guess one Sorry, drawback of that is the English always, isn't it, Martin? Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, yes. No, it's not localized to uh, different languages. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, we we could we could extend it at some point for that, but uh, right now it's not. Um, I was gonna say the date format is a one of those functions that is modeled after MySQL. So the the specifiers that you see are, are gonna be the MySQL uh, ones. You can see that in the Trino docs, but you can also refer to the MySQL docs for that. Yeah, the Trino docs is very extensive there. has a lot of yeah. info, so make sure. Yeah, there's another function that is analogous to it. It's called format date time. And that uses the Java syntax for formatting uh, timestamps, which is different no, and more powerful in some cases. So, so, I mean, that's why we have both. Okay, I didn't realize the format date time one. I do realize the one. So there's also extract. That's kind of interesting. Um, if you want to run this, you just extract out of a longer 
timestamp, you can just extract the value. You see here it's 11 months from this date, November. So if you want to just pull this out, you can also just go the month of something. That's a similar approach, just a shortcut, basically. Oops, did I mess something up? Oh, you see like the, the words month timestamp is running. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. So this extracts that. But another one that's very powerful is just a normal format function. Um, it, it has all these like um, patterns you can use as well. And that allows you to also format the date. So there's lots of options literally to, to grab um, and convert a temporal data type into something readable for your output on your client application. So lots of cool things to do. Now that's about date and times. Do we need to talk anything else or mention anything else? I think that was pretty inten intensive. I will add that timestamp other, that other function as well into the slide. So we have it for completeness. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I would say like, uh, go look at the documentation. There's uh, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot more functions and, and details on the documentation. Yeah, maybe we should do that quickly just so everyone knows, right? Like in the Trino documentation on the website, there's, <laughs> functions and operators. So there's two things. There's um, in the SQL language, there is the data type section, which talks about all the different types available. And you see the date and time section is a bit longer here. So that's very useful. And then in the functions, you have them ordered by the different topics. And obviously date and time is one big topic. And you see here the MySQL date functions, for example, there's all those, the Java date for function is down here as well. So. A lot of stuff is going on here. And you also, if you don't, if you know the name or have a guess at the name of a function, as I mentioned last time, you can run show functions as a command, but you can also um, look at our list of functions by alphabetical, right? So if you go by like something D for date, something, then you can see here, there's all those available. So you should be able to find what you're looking for, hopefully. Another thing that's always big and everywhere is strings, right? And in Trino, we have multiple types there. Um, there's char for fixed length, var char, variable length with a limit, and then var binary, variable length for binary data. And of course, with strings, there is a lot to do as well. The usual concatenation um, either uses the concat or double, double pipe. Is it pipe symbol? I guess pipe. Yeah, pipe. Yeah. Um, um, to concatenate. So if you look at this example here, for example, we can very easily just, you know, pipe them or concat them. You can also do a function called concat WS, which stands for, uh, I don't know. Uh, with separator, with separator. With separator, okay, fair. Yeah. Um, this is a, a cheap and easy way to make a comma separated list, for example, because the first character gets used and concatenates all the others beside by side. So um, if we run around this here, you'll see I get a comma separated list of first name, last name, middle name, by just having a comma once versus in these ones up here. It does the same thing, but I have to have a comma here and an operator and then another one. So it gets much more messy, right? So don't wanna deal with that. So concat WS, if you have to deal with comma or tab separator or whatever, kind of stuff, you can build that up fairly nicely. Um, what I wanted to talk about a bit more is um, on, the, on the string side of things, there is UTF-8 as the default, but Trino also supports Unicode and Unicode is composed of code points. Um, I'm showing a little bit here how you can like from UTF-8 show accepting character. So here, for example, if we run this, this actually talks and takes the binary data. This one actually uses the Unicode and this is the little, I think it's a snowman. It's a bit small. Yeah, so so just to clarify, the the um, internal rep representation of strings in Trino is UTF-8. All strings in Trino are U Unicode because uh, I mean, at the end of the day, UTF-8 is a representation for Unicode. Yeah. There's in the C, in the SQL language, there's a, a couple of different ways to to define a string. When you do u ampersand, 
that's an indication that the string you're going to specify is a Unicode string with Unicode escapes potentially. That's why uh, there's uh, backslash 2603 is interpreted as, a, um, as a snowman. If you were to create a regular string, that backslash 2603, I, I think it would just be a backslash 23603. So it doesn't get interpreted. So it's, it's uh, just a way to say uh, this is a uh, just a, um, a literal ASCII string versus, um, uh, well, not ASCII, but it's a, it's a string without escape, escape codes versus a, a string with escape codes in, embedded. Mm. Um, but under the covers, it's all, it's all UTF-8. Uh, all the operations that happen on, on strings take into account code points, uh, which uh, a code point is effectively, a, say, you could think of a Unicode character. It's, it's, I mean, that's a kind of a simplification, but that, that's kind of a gist of it. So for example, if you are, um, if you're doing a substring or your, 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 uh, yeah, substring, so it's just to say you, you want to get the, the first three characters of a, of a UTFA string, you can just say, okay, give me the first three bytes because UTF-8 characters are variable length from one to four uh, bytes each. So the operations that does the substring needs to understand what the boundaries are of each of the code points in the UTF-8 UTF representation and, and Trino does all that for you automatically. But UTF-8 still means it stays on the UTF-8 character set. It doesn't go beyond, right? Like if there is like, glyphs or whatever that are like multiple code points and beyond, then that doesn't work anymore then. Uh, correct. I mean, UTF-8 is a representation for Unicode that encodes each code point as a variable length um, uh, value from one to four bytes. Then Unicode is actually more complicated than that because you have what's called graphemes and graphemes are combinations of, uh, of code points. And really you should be when you're doing operations over strings, you should be looking at graphemes, but that's a much more complicated thing. And, and we don't handle that in Trino. It, it, it requires a lot more, um, I know, maybe we would need to replace some of the, of the core bits of, of Trino with some Unicode library for that. Um, yeah, but like generally much. coverage with UTF-8 is pretty complete and like most things yeah. work perfectly fine, right? So that's, that, that's important to... Yeah. To think about and then when you do things like locale and lowercase that will vary right like right like how my, how well that works right so but i i'm guessing people that that are regularly uh, like using languages like japanese like we know for example we have a large Trino community in japan uh shout out to yuya um and gang uh, <laughs> um I, i'm sure they know all the pains about that kind of stuff much more and then when you work with that, you're, you're aware of those gotchas. So just keep that in mind when you work with these kind of um, data sets that have different data encoding in terms of language and stuff. That some of those things that you like assume, oh, it's just going to be like, I'll just do a like length off and it'll work fine. It might not, right? So just be careful, basically. Okay. Yeah. So that's about strings. Um, there is all the things available you can think of and more. Please do look at the documentation, right? Like LPAD, right? Pad trim starts with string bows. Trim is actually one that was added recently from one of the newer SQL uh, specifications and then split and like all the stuff you can imagine and more is basically available. And I'll, I'll let you go, guys all play with that <laughs> on your own. String comparison is something that is, however, also different and then we need to talk about that a little bit because when you write queries where you want to do some string comparison um the like keyword always comes in mind and there is two kind of like um placeholders by standard in the sql specification <coughs> um percentage symbol is for yeah. any character like any sequence of random characters beyond and then the Z one zero or more zero or more zero or more yeah and then um, the underscore is for one. So right. this statement, for example, well, let's see if I have it here. Yeah, I have it here. Oh, sorry. One. So you see this one returns Algeria and Argentina as countries that start with A, but it also returns Japan because it the fifth character is an N. And then there's no characters after, right? So this is a contrived query, obviously, but 
you can do uh, yeah also, uh, pattern yeah also. one important thing one important thing here and this goes back to the discussion about unicode is that each character in this case is a unique uh, a unicode code point um so if you have more uh, some of those more complex strings that have uh graphene clusters in them then they won't behave as uh, as expected but uh for anything else uh, either ascii or 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 the simpler unicode where each code point is a character then it will work fine cool and then of course string comparison is much more powerful right there's regular expression functions available that use mostly the java regex syntax and there's a lot of them available Here's just some of the mention, count, extract, like, position, replace, all using that regex simple. And then, of course, you know, once you dive into that, you'll you'll realize that that's very, very powerful to, to do your comparisons. Now, when we talk about data analysis, you always talk with, uh, like, end up dealing with numbers as well. And Trino obviously has good coverage for math and numbers as well. Integers come as tiny int, small int, int, or integer and then big int. Floating point are real or double and then exact numerics come with a decimal. So those are the data types supported for the plain mathematics. Yeah. Go, go up, go up uh, one moment, uh, Manfred. So tiny int, small int, int and big int map effectively to an 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit and 64-bit uh, number in, in a, a modern CPU. Then real and double map to flow, uh, uh, 16-bit uh, floating point, sorry, 32-bit floating point for real and 64-bit floating point for double. So those are IEEE 754 uh, numbers. So, and they carry all the, all the implications and semantics of dealing with IEEE 754. So if you are used to, a pro, uh, if you're a programmer, uh, any, any modern language that has uh, Floating point numbers will be dealing with these, like in C and C plus and Java, etc. Mm -hmm. And an exact numerics is decimal, which would you would need when you don't want to lose anything in the. Correct. If you're using, if you're doing, uh, if you're representing money, uh, you should use decimals, not real or double, because those are. Uh, subject to uh, approximations yeah. when dealing with uh, large and mix, mixing large magnitudes, low, small magnitudes, adding a lot of numbers. Some operations are not associative, so you have to be careful with those. Yeah, don't make any money disappear in the ether. <laughs> <laughs> or appear <Yeah>. from. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and, and Trina supports all the math you can think of. So obviously the normal operators, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and uh, modulus operations, but then also like the various math, like trigonometry, random statisticals. Um, alphabetically, I looked this up. We don't have any X, Y, Z functions. So it goes from apps for absolute to... Wilson interval upper as the last one in the alphabet that we have <laughs> that I could find. Mm -hmm. But essentially, look at the documentation you see here. If I jump over here, um, there is a lot all broken up into different subjects. And, you know, the lists are, it's basically everything you can think of, right? Like logarithmic and like that kind of stuff. Um, all is there. So knock yourselves out and make Trina work hard for you and do all the math you need. Beyond math, there's lots more available in Trino as well. So um, you can do binary operations and bitwise operations. So the binary ones are similar, but you can also chop things up and so on. Even color is available a little bit. And then geospatial is a big section that Trino can uh, do a lot of stuff with. What, what standard does, does Trino lean on when it comes to geospatial, right? Like there's probably one project that's very big in that, in, in that area, isn't it? Well, so for geospatial, the the functions that we offer in Trino are modeled after the um, I think it's called the SQL Multimedia Extensions. It's a uh, it's a, a, an extended part of the standard, and and we we don't implement it exactly the same way because it relies on object oriented constructs and all that in databases. We don't have that, so we we try to replicate as closely as possible. Um, and then under the covers, I think we. We use the ESRI library for all the geospatial mm -hmm. functions. 
So yeah, I, mean, I think that, that, that sort of ESRI stuff, they work closely with the PostGIS problem project as well, right? Yeah, so yeah, stuff yeah. People that are familiar with that kind of stuff will find a lot of those things uh, to look sim similar. And then, of course, we have support for various data sketches, T-digest, Z-digest, then hyperloglog, -log -log and, uh, and others. And then a little bit of machine learning is there as well. There's a couple more that are interesting and like for us in the computer world often uh, very helpful. I wanted to mention, and those are very uh, cool little functions I'm gonna show you. So you can do parse data size, for example, um, which calculates from the usual string of um, like a, a data size that you have like three terabyte or here 2.3 megabyte or so and calculates it over in bytes, which is kind of very nice. You don't have to deal with that. The contains function that's overloaded in various things as a name, but it also supports IP address ranges. So uh, if you need to do kind of any network kind of stuff, then this will work. So, oops, sorry, wrong button. So for example, it says here this 10, 10, 10, 8 is not in the 11 IP, like it's not in that, like this IP address is not in that range. You also yeah. notice this is again, this declaration IP address is an actual data type, right? Right. Yeah. So that's- Yeah, and the, and, the, and the first argument there is called, is what's called a CIDR. I don't know if that's yeah, how you cider, pronounce it, yeah. but um, either, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a IP address range syntax. Like you see this slash eight or like here, this slash 128, that's the same syntax. Right, so ports IP4 and IP6 addresses. Yeah. Yeah, this, this people are not used to seeing this. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, IPv6 hasn't made it as much as it should or <laughs> people were hoping for. Now, one thing that's also always happened is you get these URLs from logs and stuff like that, um, website logs, so e-commerce site logs and whatever. If you need to deal with the URLs and like extract them, there's a whole bunch of extract functions for URLs. Here, for example, I can easily extract Trino.io out of this, but just URL extract host. And there's all the others you can think of as well, like, you know, protocol and path and whatever. If you're creating data, sometimes it's also useful to create a universally unique identifier. Trino can just run this, you can just run this function. And if I run this again, it's going to create me a new one. So it's always a new unique one. So that's really cool. So lots of functions here in Trino. Um, and that rounds it up for, for some of this overview. Now we're gonna jump into a bigger topic that is uh, another data type and that is JSON. Why is JSON important, Martin? <laughs> well, there's JSON data everywhere. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, I think at this point is a de facto format for a, a, like a, a anything like, well, as, you see, as you have it there, uh, everything from, uh, APIs, uh, documents, configuration files, serialization for of different uh, different types of objects. Uh, some people use that as a as a way to do structured logging and so on. So being able to operate over uh, on JSON is, uh, is is important. And, and so so you know, has, it uh, all the capabilities for that. Yeah, and it stands for JavaScript Object Notation, but it's gone way beyond, right? Like, like it right. or not, it is there to be used and. Trino has really cool modern support for that. So these are the main JSON functions. Trino has more, but those are the main ones. Um, so you can extract data from JSON, right? Like JSON is often an, uh, like an, a complex kind of text construct of things. And then you want to get to like a little bit in the middle. So there's JSON exists, JSON query and JSON value. And then you can also construct or build up JSON from data which is useful, say, for example, if you have a bunch of stuff in a data source and you need to build up a payload for submitting something to a web service or so, you can do that in SQL and then uh, let the rest of your programming language deal with like actually submitting it or whatever. So lots of cool yeah, stuff. That, so, so, let me, uh, so these, these functions are, um, they are part of the SQL specification. They were added, uh, some of them in, SQL 2016, so a few years ago. And there were a few extensions that were added in the latest revision of the specification that came out this year. So oh, wow, this year as well. Yeah, and, and that's, 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 that's great to know. And also, 
important to understand. Uh, Twino is very much trying to be on top of implementing all these standard features. Um, and these have arrived. All of these functions are quite powerful. So if you look at JSON exists here, has a whole bunch of arguments. I'll show you those also for the others later. But the main thing I want to see is a little bit of an example. So here, for example, what's important to understand is these JSON functions use the JSON path language. So you need to sort of like understand that more. I'm not going to have time to explain this here. But here, for example, if you run this JSON exists, the first example, you see this returns true in the first case and false in the second. So it looks here, it does a lax evaluation of this JSON string. And then it looks at the absolute value, like it returns the app like app of minus one or that. And in case you see here, it works for minus one, doesn't work for any, like it doesn't okay. exist as a, as a valid value, right? So, and this syntax here that you can do here is very complex. There's a lot you can do here. For example, if you look at this next example, I have a three row section where I have a unique identifier and then this JSON string that's arguably a bit longer. If I run this, oh, no, I just did the highlighting mistake again, sorry. <laughs> um, you see, I get 101 as a column, I get description, and then I have these functions. JSON exists, I'm, like, uh, I'm doing this lax evaluation of the description. And I say, is there a two, like uh, index two record, which means there's more than two children, right? In this case, there's one, two, three values in this children uh, array. This is a JSON array syntax, by the way. And then the other ones, there's not, right? So it does all the evaluation with this short syntax. And you can make this much more powerful here as well, right? Like for example, here, it looks at the actual value of each one of them in the array and sees if it has one than 12, greater than 12. And they then says they, are, they have a teenager in this case. Well, the only one that's greater than 12 is this 16 value. And correspondingly, this returns true here. So this, this JSON syntax is pretty powerful, but also pretty confusing to learn and like look uh, look at Martin. <laughs> but it is well documented in our documentation. So what's your experience with getting that going? Well, I mean, we had to write our own uh, JSON path interpreter because it's uh, so SQL defined. It says it uses JSON path, but there's a few differences from the standard JSON path. Uh, and, and we had to build a whole, a whole implementation from the ground up. So, <laughs> that was, that was <laughs> so you had a lot of fun, I guess. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Cool. Um, so, that way, it's super yeah. powerful. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, they, we used to have support for JSON path before the, these functions were added, but they were much more limited. Now you can. Yeah. Do, these are the like, new guess, ones. Um, I'll mention any of the docs. There's also the older ones. But these are the ones you should be using if you're dealing with JSON. Um, also, if you looked at some of our older training class material, they still use the old functions because they were from before. So now, um, JSON query, again, look at this. This is a powerful command. There's a lot going on here, and we're just going to scratch the surface. It allows you to basically extract a JSON value from another JSON value. So if you look at this example here, I'm going to run JSON query from this JSON snippet here. And then I'm gonna get, once I'm gonna get our language, once I'm gonna get the first, like the, in, the, uh, in this array, languages array, I get the first value and I get the name value out. So in this case, I would get Java and in this case, I would Python. So look at that. When it runs, here is the actual raw data that I'm parsing and then I get Java and Python. And now these are JSON values still as compared to JSON value, like these are JSON data. Now comparing that to JSON value, this extracts a SQL scalar value from a JSON. So in this case, if I run this next function, now I'm going JSON value here and doing the same thing. And I'm comparing this. You see, 
the first one fails because if it just looks at this whole string and says, well, give me that as a SQL, then it doesn't know what to do with it because, well, it's just a random something. So it can't cast it to a string, but the name, obviously it can do that. It's just a, a simple string and it cuts off the uh, the apostrophes, right? Like it doesn't, it's it's an actual string in this case. So, so that's, that's JSON value versus JSON query. And you can like use those to dive very deep into, into a more complex structure. JSON array allows you to create a JSON array. So you can do things like the opposite. We're build it on, building it up now. So you go over here. If I run this, it builds me an array of these three elements in the JSON structure, right? I can also go like this, but JSON array is also more powerful. So if I go null and I use the null on null, I can also cause it to actually insert me a null and, or I can like say, well, actually this needs to be watch of 500 values. Then this makes it a, a longer one. So you, there's a lot more yeah. power again on this JSON array mm -hmm. syntax as well. Let me comment quickly on uh, quickly on the null. So by default, JSON array ignores nulls. Yeah. Um, like if you have compl a complex expression that returns nulls, then those values will, will get ignored. So that's, that's where it, it can be useful. But if you want to include them, then you can do the on null, uh, null on null uh, clause to say yeah. uh, include include nulls. Yeah. Cool. So you can build up those arrays, and obviously arrays are important in JSON. And then if you want to build an actual JSON object, you'd use, well, JSON object. And this <laughs> one builds it up from key value pairs. Um, again, with a whole bunch of different additional commands you can potentially use. So if you look at this one, just make a very simple JSON object, key value pair, right? Name, value Java, builds it up in this like square bracket and colons syntax. If I now do an array called languages, now this here is kind of not yet what we wanted from the original because you see here, there's no, like these are not key value pairs. So we can combine that in this kind of setup where we go JSON object languages, and then the value is a JSON array of two more JSON objects. And that then builds us what we initially parsed in the other way as well, right? So it's kind of the reverse before we parsed it. Now we're building it up. Uh, by the way, you can also use colons instead of the value keyword there. Like here, like so. Yeah. It's closer to the real thing. Let's test if Martin is telling us that it's true. It is working. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's because I typed it right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's JSON object. So you can build up and tear down JSON uh, things. There's other JSON uh, things to learn, right? Like, as I mentioned, the JSON path language is very, very complex or, and powerful. Um, and there's a long section in the docs to, to dive through. And there's, these functions are all from the spec, as you saw, very, very powerful. Um, the JSON data type itself that is supported in Trino can contain JSON objects, arrays, JSON numbers, strings, true, false, and null. As you saw, like we, we had that null inserted with the null on null. That's a, a valid thing in JSON. And so are true and false, by the way. And there's other functions available. So um, you can convert a JSON, a varchar to a JSON type and back. So this one, these two examples are kind of cool. So you can see here, I'm JSON passing this one, two, three, four, five, nine. This is an actual JSON, like you see here, type of JSON parse. <laughs> this is the JSON data type, not the other way around. I'm JSON formatting this one, two, three. And then this is actually a VARC. So um, both back and forth, you can uh, deal with those JSON parse and JSON format functions as well. Now, we are, as I expected, running short on time. I 
think, what do you think, Martin? Should we dive into structural data types? There's a lot to it. And then obviously we have more data and aggregation techniques as well, but we also like ran into a lot of things and had very good discussions. Um, I mean, I think we should uh, pause here and, and maybe tackle questions. Uh, yeah, let's do that. Um, we have much more material prepared. And as I expected, we um, had too much good time teaching you about the importance of JSON and, and data types and date and time. So we will uh, teach you some more of this uh, stuff another time. So let's see what questions we have. Um, looking at the chat. <coughs> All right, let's see. Um, all right, this is like an insider one. Um, would we be interested in adding stuff that's not part of the SQL syntax? That's probably like part of the SQL standard. So maybe that's worth a discussion um, because it comes up enough. Like SQL is standardized under the ISO slash um, NC standard organization um, and we try to adhere to them as much as possible, right, Martin? Yeah, so for any language constructs, we try to be as close to the standard as possible. Sometimes the standard doesn't cover some functionality and and I mean, it's something that is useful, we'll, we'll uh, consider how to add it. Um, we have to be careful with adding things in a way that won't create conflicts in the future when the standard extends uh, to, to support that. So something takes a bit more consideration, but uh, but yeah, we definitely open to some, uh, we, we, we already have some extensions to the language uh, that, that we implemented very carefully. For functions, there's a lot more flexibility and and, and we'll, we'll definitely consider adding functions. Um, we need to make sure that the functions are consistent with the rest of the function library, that they follow the, the same uh, style the same conventions and all that, but absolutely we'll 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 add them. And then now with the we have in the in recent versions a couple of things that you can do. First, uh, you can create your own functions uh, in in using the SQL language itself. So you don't need to rely necessarily on uh, on on the function existing in Trina itself. And yeah, this is second, called routines, by the way, <laughs> and we will cover that in our class with Dane and you in a month's time. So we'll talk about yeah. that a lot more and show you that. Yeah, and then for more complex things, you can always write a plugin to uh, to uh, introduce new functions. If you if you are trying to do things that cannot be done using that SQL dialect and you get to implement them in, in Java. And, and and with the support, and we, we can revamp the way functions work in the engine, you can now declare Function or have a plugin that declares functions, and you can mount them in a catalog and schema, so you can include them only for the queries that matter, or you can namespace them, so you have better control over uh, uh, when they they are they are usable, who can access them, and so on. Uh, Kwasi Irfan is asking related to that: Can we write C extensions like we can do in Postgres? Um, not C, but Java or any JVM language. Uh, I'm showing you here the functions documentation. Right. This is how you write a plugin that can implement functions. You would write them in Java um, as a plugin, that, and then they can provide that. That's the old way of doing it, Manfred. Yeah, yeah, um, the old way of doing it. Yeah. But he's like when he's talking about C low level. Yeah. The new way is to just write it as. No, 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 no. Sorry, I was referring the the plugins. That's the old old style of plugins. Now we have uh, connectors that can provide functions. That's uh, oh. we need to uh, we need to update the docs. But uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then there's also table functions, obviously, as well. Then that's another larger topic as well. <laughs> right. Let's see what other questions I can see here. Oh yeah, there was one about like how can IP functions do a contains well if i go back to that um it's not actually an ip like there's not an ip address that oh. contains another ip address it's an ip address range or martina so call it correct right yeah, yeah yeah well the question is what does contains mean for ip address uh contains what it checks is whether an ip address is contained in a 
uh, uh, IP address range or a or a network or a cider. That's what uh, yeah. Hang on, I'm just so yeah. Like this syntax here. Oops. Ah, oh, come on. Yeah, the this syntax. syntax the slash eight. That means that's a range. Yeah, that that basically says it's a prefix of an IP address range uh, of eight bits. So basically, the the ten is like. Uh, what you asking? What, what, what that's asking is whether the IP address eleven two fifty five two fifty five two fifty five is contained in the range represented by um, any IP address that starts with a ten in the first uh, segment. Um, so, so yeah, the, the first one is not an IP address; it's a it's a, it's a range. So, just how how uh, routing and and network addresses are represented. Yeah, exactly. Um... Is there a function for modifying JSON data? Um, yeah, yeah, we. I think I, I talked about that. There's no, there, there are no built-in ways to modify a JSON value. So if you have a, a JSON value and you want to append or remove um, new new keys, if it's a JSON object, there's no way to do it. You have to kind of. Um, uh, run trip through a converting converting it to a map and then removing things from the map and then convert it back to JSON, which is cumbersome and expensive, as as uh, someone uh, indicated. Uh, and I, I was I was saying, uh, if that's a common thing, like we should just just add something to it. So uh, I asked to file a, an enhancement request, and we can we can look into what the syntax and semantics should be. But yeah, absolutely makes sense. Yeah, so the question would basically be like, say, like, uh, hang on, what's here? Like, say you would want to change this to Scala, right? Like, right. one function, right? Like that kind of that's the that's the use case or question. So yeah, or or add a new a new field or add a new one. Uh, right? like, yeah, add Rust or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, all types of, or oh, that's maybe interesting. All types, the mathematical types, all types are signed. Is that correct? Correct. Inside Trino, yes. Uh, and these are modeled after what the SQL specification says. Uh, so they are signed. Um, in some connectors, uh, I think Cole was saying this, in some connectors, some connectors support unsigned types. And when that happens, they will get mapped to the corresponding type that can cover the range of unsigned types. Um, but but yeah, that's uh, there, there's no built-in unsigned types in, in SQL. Okay, um, I'm sort of skimming through the questions. I think that's pretty much all we had in terms of the questions. Again, um, I apologize for not covering everything we wanted to cover. But at the same time, that's good because that means we can do another class another day. <laughs> I have to just capture mm -hmm. Martina, some other expert again, or maybe me and Cole even do it. Um, if you are uh, interested in the material, it's all going to be available again uh, on the Trino blog. We'll post about it. We'll put the video out there. The slide deck contains more, more content that we were going to talk about, structural data and analyzing, filtering data, and then aggregation techniques. Um, We'll probably follow up another day with that, not a problem. Um, the SQL language specification, all the functionality in Trino is a very big, very powerful topic. And there's lots to talk about. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's good for you to have all that power available and good for us to be able to teach you. And of course, um, it's also good because with Starburst Galaxy, you can play around. You get a free account. You can play around with it on your own. You saw me just like, you know, hacking around there, no fast, just pressing the query and it starts up the cluster and runs. Um, so take advantage of that. And then also please uh, make sure to register for our upcoming next SQL training classes. We'll have David join me next time. We'll talk about adding data and modifying data and that kind of stuff. Um, the Trino website and documentation obviously is there. Martin, myself and everyone else, we're all on the Trino Slack community. You can find us there. And we'll hopefully get you hooked up with the right uh, people to answer your questions, or we might even be able to answer them ourselves. Um, look at the Trino presentation and get started repos. The presentation repo specifically is what I just showed you the slide deck from. It contains 
example SQL scripts. So all the statements we ran today and more are all in there for you to just cut and paste. And then you can also learn more on Starburst Forum and Starburst Academy. And most importantly, register for Trino Summit. Uh, Martin is going to talk about all the cool stuff that came to Trino in the last year and all the successes we had and like um, new features and stuff like that. And then, of course, we'll have a lot of other presenters and we'll let you know about some of those. And if you are interested, there's still time to tell us about your great usage of Trino um, in in your organization or what you're trying or what you're hacking together. Um, we would love to find out more about that and uh, share it with the rest of the Trino community. We did the questions and answers. So thank you for joining me again, Martin. It was awesome. Um, just as I expected, yeah, <laughs> we didn't cover everything. <laughs> but that's cool, right? All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. That was that.